Bonjour. Hola. So you know, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I grew up in south of France. So I'm a guy from the south. <laughs> and my accent, my accent in French is so strong, I think it's better for you that I speak in English. OK? Yeah. yeah. OK, so this is not very convenient, but we'll, because it's like a little bit too formal, but we, we are going to work with that. And maybe tomorrow we might do something else. We'll see. <clears throat> Basically, we are going to be together for three, um, doing three days, two hours each days, and uh, with the title, general title, the digital world. But before introducing the, the free kind of lectures. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me to, to give me some other opinion or to let me know that you don't agree with me. Uh, I want to try to give you a few, uh, a few, a little bit some background of what I'm doing and, and actually why I'm here. First of all, um, I'm French. When I say that, <laughs> it's not something very original, even though it is a little bit in Mexico. Uh, Mexico and in Latin America nowadays. But which means that I'm not American also. So I'm not against the US. I've lived there for a few years. I did my PhD on the American cultural system, the art system in the US. And I wrote several books about the theater and uh, other subjects in the US. But I have a, a kind of mixed feelings with the US. You know, the love, hate, relationships. In a way, it's a little bit probably like Mexicans. We love the US, but also we, we don't always like them. And of course, on the internet, it's going to be extremely important. We are going to see that. The second element is I'm a kind of bizarre researcher. I'm doing research. So I've, I have an academic background. And uh, I teach. I also uh, have my a PhD and several master degrees. But I'm also doing field research, a little bit like a journalist. So it's a kind of methodology. Uh, I don't want to use the big words of like theory or whatever, but that is very, uh, I would say, uh, adapted to the work I, I want to do. When you work on the internet, you can go, you can stay in your apartment, go online, and go everywhere in the world. It's cheap, it doesn't cost you anything, and you can, why not, write a book about that? or write an essay about that. I've done exactly uh, the opposite. My first rule was everywhere, uh, everything I, I'm going to, to say ab about the internet, I have to go where it's organized, where, where it's done. So basically, the idea of internet being a global conversation somewhere around us is not my, my main approach, basically. I go on the field. I'm a res field researcher. I go everywhere as much as I can. And I meet big guys, big names. In Mexico, I met, I don't know, uh, the Carlos Slim family and these kind of people. But also little guys in startups and little uh, in favelas or in uh, ghetto. Uh, <clears throat> and also a researcher and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, uh, the research I'm going to basically introduce to you today has been made in the last three, four, five years in 50 countries, which takes a long time <laughs> to travel. And among them, probably 20, where well, I've been one, two, three, four, five times. Uh, so it's a very non-ideological approach, very field research, and uh, uh, everything is first hand, which is another way of saying that, 
of course, I read books. Of course, I, I use statistics. Of course, I use a lot of uh, um, quantitative data. But my work is mainly on the quality uh, information that I can get traveling, meeting people, doing interviews. And in, uh, at the end, it's more than probably 2,000 interviews for, for the last book that is going to be published here in the fall, November. And mainstream, which was the previous one, uh, it's also probably 1,500 in, interviews. But I'm also a journalist, which means that uh, you don't just do, uh, you, you, you're not ju just doing research that is interesting and academic, but you also want to speak to the people. So you need to find stories. And to find stories means not necessarily to be an academic. So it's always a little bit difficult. You are an academic, but you cannot stay an academic. You are a journalist, but you want also to be very serious. So I'm in this kind of border between academic life and journalism. I try to do my best to be good in both uh, sides. And I hope you will enjoy uh, the, the way I will introduce my subjects. So we are going to be three days together, two hours uh, every day, so it's not so long, on the digital world. Today, I'm going to mainly focus on uh, uh, general overview, um, maybe a little bit more political of, of my, my view, my hypothesis of what I want to, to give you as, uh, as information. I will make a long point on emerging countries today, then uh, another one pretty long on the US, and then if we have the time on China today, US, China, it's the perfect model and counter model. I think uh, I've, I, the comparison between the two models uh, is extremely interesting, especially on the internet. Then tomorrow, we are going to focus more on some examples a little bit everywhere around the world. I will focus on two kinds of places, smart cities, and I will say, um, more, uh, more difficult areas, like favelas or uh, ghettos. On the side of smart cities, I will look at Skolkovo in Russia, which is a new city, so you probably don't know it. When I was there, there is only, only rabbits, uh, basically, but the city is growing. Kansas City, another new city in Nairobi, close to, I mean, in Nairobi, close to Nairobi in Kenya. Then Porto Digital in Recife, Brazil, uh, Bangalore in India, uh, the Silicon Valley in Israel, what we call startup, the startup nation, and uh, the Chilicon Valley in Santiago de Chile. So it's going to be my, it's not my, my word. They, 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 they call themselves the Chilicon Valley. And by the way, I didn't eat any chili in Chile, so I was very unhappy by that. And they said to me, it's very bad chili, and it's only, only in Mexico. So I said, OK, I'm going to let them know that. Uh, and then in front of the smart cities, which is basically, uh, I would say, modern city going to the future, I will work tomorrow also on, uh, I will discuss more revi revita revitalization. So how you can revitalize a city thanks to the internet. And then I will focus on India, Brazil, and, and Kenya as well. And we will see things like empowerment, digital literacy, and actually how the main subject is not now the digital divide, but more the digital uh, literacy. So the first, um, I will say, conference, I don't know, today will be more political. The second one will be so more social and economic. The third one will be more cultural. And then I will focus more on culture, on content, on media, journalism, information, curation. And, uh, uh, and it's going to be the free part, basically, of these three days. At the end of the class, I will give you a, a bibliography, uh, maybe through paper or, or through the internet, we'll see. And then you can go back on, I mean, read some books uh, that 
I will mention probably or at least some ideas during the uh, the free classes, the free uh, conferences. I want to add that I mean I'm not very French, as you know, even though I'm French. You know, the French in general they have a tie when they are professor or something. So I'm I was uh, more in uh, in the U.S. for a part of my life, and uh, I um, I think it's also important to to communicate, not just to do a, a, a straight, uh, you know, lecture. So if you have the time and if you want, I want to suggest uh, two or three things. First of all, if one of you is working on a specific topic linked to the internet or cultural industries, video games, uh, music, uh, movies, uh, all these subjects that have, have been, which have been my focus in the last couple of years, I can give you specific advice or bibliography in a one-to-one -one quick uh, discussion after the class tomorrow or the day after. If some of you uh, want to work in the future in one of the field, diplomacy, uh, cultural diplomacy, uh, communication journalism, business startup, and so on, we can discuss like small groups also tomorrow and Thursday after the class. Uh, we will, uh, I will give you a, a paper and you can just give me your name and we try to find a place to, to see each other. If there is a people that learn French here, I hope there is at least one or two. There is some that learn French here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so then we can meet also together because I'm always, you know, try to improve my French. And, uh, uh, and at the end, if, if some of you have a project or anything you want to communicate with me, uh, I'm, I'm free. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm staying on this campus until Friday. Friday. So you, my email is martel, like my name, 2016 at yahoo.com. And on Twitter, I'm martel f. So it's easy to find me, martel f or martel2016 at yahoo.com Ah, did somebody want my email? <laughs> Martel 2016 I don't know why 16 It's because before it was 13 and you know uh, at yahoo.com Okay um, so I just want to ask you one or two questions before I go ahead. Why do you ex expect, why do you come to this class or to this conference? They said, I'm a nice guy, you should meet me. Tell me, what do you want? Do you want... Uh, Something, do you want to learn something? Do you want to, what could be the motivation? Yes? I came to and you want to work on this field? I oh, already, okay. Yeah. Professional. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Somebody was, yes. not a professional project. So you're here because there is some light and it's a little bit not <laughs> uh, cool, uh, AC, and so it's nice. <laughs> no, no, that's not the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm interested now. Uh, this project actually has to do with the internet, but more so with anonymity and uh, slut shaming on the internet. So we're, we're going to try to investigate some, some apps that are gaining uh, popularity more so in Mexico right now and investigate the, the, the phenomenon of, uh, well, the relationship between anonymity 
and slut shaming in 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 many apps that that we can, that we use every day. So I think that we could actually go somewhere with, with this uh, conference. One or two other remarks. I saw some other people. Where? Which one? So basically, what you expect of this presentation? Somebody was here. Hey, this guy. Wait for the microphone. Um, it's about the topics of your books. Is very about the topics of your books is yes. very controversial. Like talking about gays and people, the mainstream culture is very interesting, and the way you touch those specific subjects is very interesting for me. Okay, so we are going to try to to answer a little bit what you expect, and I'm going to begin maybe by three, I would say three short images. Um, and actually one is very new uh, because uh, I was last week I spent the week uh, to Cuba um, all week it's long <laughs> it's pretty long <clears throat> and I tried to see how internet works in Cuba not much um, what is interesting it's several things first of all you have some kind of uh, I w wouldn't even say cyber cafe, cyber cafe, because they are not even cafe, not even cyber, but at least places where you can enter after a long queue, paying a, a, a strong, I mean, an important price, about 10 cook. Cook means basically $10, which is a lot for a Cuban person. It's more than one week of salary sometimes. And uh, giving your ID. And more than just giving to the kind of civil servant, very angry, that is there like uh, to, to be against you, he has to, he, he asks you what site, which site you would like to visit. So before <laughs> entering to the internet, before going to internet, you have to say, I want to go there and so on. And it's very expensive. So quite often the people I've seen come with their, already they, have, they wrote what they want to say mainly on Facebook, all these kind of things. And uh, they, of course, they don't play video games. They don't, uh, they don't, uh, uh, they don't do anything funny. And uh, basically, uh, I would say it's very difficult to, to go there very often. The other way to get internet is through uh, some iPhone, I mean, smartphones, whatever they are. Phones are kind of now pretty much, I mean, not everywhere, but at least you have, you have, smart, you have, you have phone in, in Cuba, and it wasn't the case three years ago when I, when I was there. So you have more, more phones, sometimes smartphone, and for the smartphone, it's pro possible sometimes to go to a special internet, which is actually an intranet, with a special type kind of email address that is only for Cuban people. So they can basically a little bit speak between them, but basically it's very difficult to go outside of the Cuban system. Then, of course, you have the military, police, probably uh, some doctors, I've seen some of them, writers that are like this kind of privileged people with more uh, uh, access of things, and sometimes they kind of get an internet connection and then uh, it's very low, very slow, uh, but they, sometimes they resell a part of it to the people that live around their house. So then it works a bit like that. When you speak to the people in general, they are, all of them of course are aware about what basically is internet because you can get television, so you have a lot of information about uh, out the outside, outside world. And at the same time, they all want Internet, even though they don't really know, uh, you know, I was very surprised when I speak to some of them. They, I mean, they didn't know what was an application, how do you work on a smartphone, but I mean, it's very normal probably, but uh, so, but they really love that, and it's one key thing they, 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 they criticize a lot the regime because of that. So this is an internet, I would say, that is missing, and that the people want to access to, to get in, even though they are not able to do that. The regime, 
has said uh, that internet was not accessible in Cuba because of the blocus by the Americans. Of course, it's not the reason, because the cable had been created between Venezuela and Cuba more than five years ago. And since that, nothing. So the cable exists, so basically internet can arrive. And then they said they are going to open 100 plus cyber cafe everywhere in the country to be able to, 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 for the people to access the internet. As far as I've seen, I mean, I stayed just in La Habana and a few cities around. I haven't seen one of them. So for me, uh, I can conclude uh, for now that internet is still something that you really want, even though it's not accessible. Second image, it was a year ago, before the war, I was in, in Gaza, uh, Palestine. I entered, by the way, by, through Egypt, which is a pretty long story <laughs> to tell, uh, number of hours and difficulties because you need the free visa. So it's extremely complex with the Egyptian authority, then the Hamas inside Gaza, and so on and so forth. But I'm not going to go on, the, on this kind of details. The interesting thing is when you go through the border, you were, I was in Egypt, so I go through the border after hours of difficulties, like less than 100 meters after the border, suddenly my phone changed. It became the Palestinian network. And then everything was perfect. You are in probably, I mean, there is also North Korea, I know, <laughs> but this is probably the, the biggest prison, jail in the world, where people can very, uh, with extremely difficulties, go out, but you can access the internet like if you were basically here or in, in Paris. I was with the people in, in Gaza City. Once again, it was before the war. Uh, and they were like knowing everything, like uh, playing video games on their iPhone, using a lot of uh, application, calling, being on Twitter, on Facebook, and so on and so forth. And basically, not just the kids, but basically everybody has a phone. Access of the internet is cheap, free, even though every communication go through Israel. No, fro no, no to other direction like Egypt or, of course, Leb Lebanon, uh, which is too far, and so on. Then the, the, the Israeli army is able to, to, to know a little bit everything that is inside Gaza. And even the people uh, working at the Hamas, I met many of them, of the Islamic Jihad, which is even more... <laughs> Uh, terrorist organization than that Hamas. They told me how basically they cannot trust the network because Israel is able, first of all, to read everything, but more than that, to send some messages, to change, to change the messages. So you post something on Twitter, and then something else appears on Twitter because Israel made uh, a change of your own message, and so on and so forth. And they are also able to, of course, to use the radio uh, or television and to put their own programs. So this is an internet which is very close to what you have, what I have. You can access internet very free in many ways, but it's act at the same time an internet to communicate with the rest of the world. And it's also an internet that helps you to, I would say, try to fight. I don't know to fight what, but at least to fight a war to fight against occupation, to fight on several things. And you are, it's easy to communicate with others. Three Im the third image, images is uh, uh, in Kibera. Kibera is one of the, the largest ghetto in, uh, in Africa. It's in Kenya. Uh, and this is a place where we, we don't know exactly, but more than one million people lives in a very uh, high level of poverty. And I was very surprised in this kind of place how, first of all, everybody basically had a, a, a phone. Everybody. They don't have the water. They don't sometimes uh, know, they don't have light, electricity, but they have, a knife, they have a phone. Not an iPhone, of course. Uh, uh, what we call a feature phone. 
So they are a basic phone, very cheap. And uh, it's funny because when they don't have electricity, they have the way with their car to recharge their, their, their phone. And uh, there are many ways to organize their life with their phone, which also, of course, is a light, which can help at night in dangerous uh, area. And it's also uh, uh, extremely interesting because they can get many applications that we have on smartphone. They recreate the application to make them available on basic phone. So for example, you can exchange message through Facebook, but it's going to go through a, a, a basic phone, but it's like SMS at the end. But uh, uh, it's very interesting how imaginative and innovative they are. And in this area, people have already a basic phone. In five years, they will have a smartphone. Today, 2.5, 2.7 billion people have access to the internet. In five years, five billion people will have access to the internet. Mainly, these two plus billion people accessing internet will get it through smartphone. It will change everything, especially in Africa and in countries where basic phones don't even exist, electricity is missing sometimes and so on and so forth. So with these three images to begin with, you see an internet that you don't have but you would like to have, an internet that you have that connects you to the world even though you are in jail, and an internet that is a way to survive, but also an internet that helps you to, I would say, try to emancipate yourself try to escape the ghetto because it's a place where you, you will have information about jobs, uh, small application about how to sell your fruit and, and vegetables because you know the price of the market of the day and then you're not going to be stole, stolen by, by the, the, the markets that will sell you bad uh, numbers to, to, to buy your product in a cheaper way and so on and so forth. So three kinds of internet. And basically, I could take uh, hundreds of other examples, and I will do that more, and more or less in the, less, in, the, in the last two other days. But my main hypothesis is that internet is not a global conversation. We, when we read the, the Silicon Valley people, typically uh, the Google CIO, um, the people from Apple, especially Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, others, they believe that we are entering a world where everybody will be in that conversation, be part of that, that frontiers and borders will disappear, that languages are not uh, so important because you have a uh, at the end, uh, Google translation, that culture will mix and that uh, when you read them, they take example uh, incredible like, you know, after all, we can rebuild uh, a, with 3D printers, painters, printers, sorry, 3D printers, some things that the Taliban, for example, has some temples that they have destroyed. I don't buy this kind of ideas. I think internet will be and is already, but will be even more fragmented. I don't say balkanized. I don't say it's a balkanization. I say it's a fragmentation. Fragmentation is much more positive word. It means, I, actually, there is a word that I like in English, which is the word frontier. In French, we have very, uh, you know, people, only one word for one thing. We have one word, frontier. And I think it's a little bit the same in Spanish. Frontier, you know what is it. But in English, we have two words, border and frontier. The border is, for example, to go to the US. You need a passport, a visa, you have like the police, a flag, and this is a separation. The frontier is not that. The frontier is more symbolic. It's like uh, how you go to the famous, especially Mexico, you know that, the, the mythology of the frontier. It's the frontier when Kennedy said, I'm going to go 
we're going to go to, to, to the moon, the new frontier. I do think that internet has no borders, but internet has frontiers. And this is why I like the separation. So no real borders, except we will go back on that about China. And as I said before, a little bit uh, Cuba. But in general, internet has no borders, but it has frontiers. The frontiers are the language, the sphere of culture you live in, the history, the things you like or you don't like. It's not necessarily always very local. It's not necessarily, I don't say we thought internet was global, it's now local. Of course not. I don't say that. It's much more complex. But this is this kind of sphere of culture that you live in, and it, it is much more complex than just the global conversation. Sometimes it can be global as well. Let's say the otaku movement, or the beers, or the femen, this kind of thing. So you can have groups, and of course the Snowden story and all these uh, groups of uh, people, they can be in a group and communicate all together in many countries. So in a way it's global, but it's not everybody that will join that conversation. It's a very community-specific conversation. Sometimes it's really linked to a territory, and I do think at the end that the territory, the locality, the, la the place where you live is much more important than anything else. And if you take, for example, maybe not you, because you're good students in a international university, but if you speak to your, maybe your nephew, your brother, little brother, and you watch on his face Facebook page, I don't think this guy will have a lot of friends in India. I don't think he will have a lot of friends in South Korea or in China or in Japan, or not even probably in Argentina, and probably not even in Mexico City. Because you have, you, you have your friend on your Facebook page. You speak to your people. You speak to, with the people that you connect to. And uh, because the internet will go through 2.7 billion people to 5 billion people very quickly, the new billions entering the internet will be even more local, even more interested in their culture where they live, speaking on the internet in their own language, and being part of this conversation with a lot of frontiers. I will come back on this hypothesis later, and you might react on that if you want. But I will try now to develop three uh, key subjects today. The first one is uh, emerging countries. The second one, the US. The third, third, third one, China. Sorry for my uh, <coughs> voice sometimes, because in Cuba I was very sick. So now it's getting better, thanks to the pharmacy in Mexico. But uh, you, know, you can get aspirin. They didn't want to give me aspirin in, in Cuba. They said I need a prescription by the doctor. I said, a prescription for aspirin? <laughs> of course, then you pay 20 cook, and you have your aspirin. Emerging countries. One of the main conclusions of my previous book, Mainstream, and actually the same conclusion for the book I've done on the gay issue, global gay, or the next one that will be published, Smart, on the internet, it's working on globalization. Of course, I'm not the first one to work on globalization. Uh, everybody has done that for, I don't know, 20 years, maybe some say 200 years. But in general, globalization is what? Is demographic, a demographic influence and a, an economic uh, transformation. OK, I'm not really in these two sectors. What I've said with mainstream is that emerging countries are also emerging with their culture. Then, with SMART, I say that emerging countries are also emerging with their internet. And for global gay, which is a, a different subject, but I wanted to work on human rights, uh, 
I don't, this is not the subject of today, but just to explain you what the three books in a way or another are connected. I do think that emerging countries emerge also with their values. And think just about something. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when we were speaking about human rights, it was basically the French, it was the British, it was the German, it was the Spanish, it was the Italian, which were the key actors of the game. Today, you have gay marriage, for example, in Argentina, and you don't have that in Germany. So think about that, how the world is changing even on the question of value and how you can react to this change. So emerging countries. Of course, emerging countries, it's a very paternalistic way to say that. And you know better than I do that we don't like to use this expression, even though we don't really know how to use it in a different way. We can say rapid growth country, this kind of expression. But when the growth is not so rapid, it doesn't work. So don't, I don't want to go on the details of the world. What I want to say, it's very simple. For me, of course, this is not just three, four countries, the so-called famous BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, as you know. Not even with Indonesia, the BRICs. Not even with South Africa, the BRICs. It's actually much more, many more countries. It is for sure Mexico, Chile. It is for sure Turkey. It is probably if the regime change and the, in a good way, which is not totally sure, of course, Egypt can even be uh, Iran in a way or another, since with the demography, with the culture uh, produced sometimes with the, the population, it's, uh, it's an, a kind of emerging country. It's also Kenya. It's probably... Uh, Nigeria. So at the end, it's a, a group of 10, 15, 20 countries. And the main idea or conclusion of what I was doing in the last couple of years is to see how these emerging countries are basically uh, creating their own content, their own media, their own internet, their own values, their own uh, ways of being themselves. And we can take tons of examples of that. For example, there is many groups uh, in a country like this one. Uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, Ca Carlos Slim, but he's not the only one, even though he, he thinks he is. Uh, NBC, for example, it's a very gr big group, uh, part Saudi Arabia, Lebanese, Egyptian that is now a key player in the game of television and internet everywhere in the Arab world and in the Middle East. NBC uh, owns, for example, Al Arabia, which is the main competitor of uh, Al Jazeera, and NBC One, which is the first uh, television basically in the Arab world. And by the way, an interesting point, uh, thanks to the internet and also to the, the Arab revolutions, NBC, which was a group that was broadcasting a single signal, signal all around the Arab world for the last, uh, I would say, 10 years, decided now, I mean, basically right now, to create different channels in, not in every country, but at least in five uh, Arab area. One is Egypt, and they already have, have created one big network of websites and uh, and, uh, and a specific TV in Egypt, which is a big market and with a lot of advertisement. A second one is the Maghreb area, so Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. The third one is Saudi Arabia, because it's also a big market. And the fifth one will be Lebanon and Syria, when, when Syria will be back, we hope, one day in, in the game. So it's interesting how globalization was creating a, 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 non, a, a, a singular uh, media in the Arab world after the end of the 
public television that were government oriented, you know, in the time of Mubarak and, and all that. And step by step, they re become regional and linked to countries. So globalization is not a phenomenon that is going to be always more uniformity, more uh, uh, generalization. It's also very specific quite often. We can take many other examples. Al Jazeera, uh, other group which is from Qatar, as you know, which is now a key player in the game of sports, news, entertainment, but also on education, things that a lot of people don't know. A lot of things for kids are made uh, uh, by Al Jazeera. Rotana is uh, today the key player for music in the, in the Arab world. It's a group based in Riyadh. Uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, they also uh, have a strong part in the movie industry uh, in Egypt, and they have also their television in uh, uh, Dubai and Amman. So it's a, it's a kind of pan-Arabic group, very influential. I can give you many other examples. Uh, of course, you, you, you get what I wanted to say. Uh, for example, uh, Reliance uh, in, in India, or Sara in India, TV Globo, of course, in Brazil, uh, you know Televisa in, in, in this country, uh, CCTV in China, and some other one. So basically, uh, emerging countries have today these kind of big groups that are extremely influential, uh, and that uh, I, I don't believe that the, that the US will disappear. I don't believe that the the internet will be uh, without uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, and so on and so forth. Of course not. But I do believe that we will have mul a multiple number of players. I will go back a little bit later on regulation, which also has a link with that. But basically, my first uh, uh, point was to, to, to say that uh, I believe that when you're Mexican, and in a way it's a little bit different than when you're French, because when you're French, it's another story, or when you're European. When you're Mexican, the world is opening. And in many aspects, from the culture, cultural industries, medias, uh, internet, you have many options, because it will be done also in Mexico, and not only in the US. So why the US? And it's my second point. The U.S., uh, uh, of course, it's very difficult things to, uh, in like a 15 minutes uh, discussion, to, to summarize uh, the U.S. I've done my, my PhD about the U.S. cultural uh, system, as I told you. It's about 3,800 pages, so if you want to read, there is a copy in the National uh, Library in Paris. You can go. Uh, and uh, three or four of my books are mainly on that. So it's extremely difficult for me to summarize very quickly uh, all that. So I'm going to take just a few points to try to give you some, uh, uh, I would say, some, some clues about the, the power and why the US is so important in all these subjects. Media, video games, cultural content, creative industries, internet. And once again, this is why I said I'm French. I'm not American. So my, my analysis, I, I try to be as neutral as possible uh, in a subject that wherever you go, especially in Latin America, it's always very ideological. And I try to avoid uh, this approach. First of all, the US is a system that, I mean, I'm not Mexican, but as, as European, we we didn't, know we didn't know very well. For us, we were you know, the cultural people. We, are, we were the people that were bringing the art to the world. So basically, France was, and in Spain, Italy, Germany, even UK, they think a little bit that way. We are the arts. So the US are just the entertainment. We have a Ministry of Culture with a minister. Actually, she was fired. Uh, five days ago, but uh, we have a new one. And she's even more beautiful than the previous one, which was already very beautiful. 
because François Hollande, our president, knows how to choose women, I think. And the new one is Korean, by the way. She was um, abandoned, you say abandoned, in the street of uh, Seoul uh, 45 years ago, and uh, she was adopted by a French family, and she became minister uh, this weekend of culture and communication. I close the brackets. Uh, so basically, we have a ministry of culture, and in the US, you don't have that. You have just the market. So this is, I mean, I'm like a bit in caricature saying that. But every, a lot of people, I mean, many, many people really believe that in France and in Europe. And of course, it is absolutely wrong. The US system is very different than the European one. But you do have a public policy for the arts, for culture, and also for the internet. It doesn't go like in France through direct public, subsidi direct public subsidies. In the US, they don't like this kind of system. Actually, Mexico is a bit like that. But it goes through philanthropy. Uh, typically, for example, when you give um, 1,000, let's say, $1,000 to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, or the Boston Symphony Orchestra, or the National Public Library, or let's say the the, the Walt Disney City Hall in Los Angeles, because an orchestra place has a Walt Disney name. And, and then you, you, you get, basically, depending on your level of uh, the rate of your uh, income tax, you get, let's say, 35 in general, so it's $350, $350 back in tax deduction. So you gave 1000 but you, you you have back 350 So actually, your gift is just $650. If you add all these little $350 all around the, the country every day, in every places, in every art system, and also actually in university, in, uh, in schools, in hospitals, and so on and so forth, at the end, this is public policy. It's actually tax the expenditure, as we call it, which means basically the money that the government doesn't get direct by, by, by as tax, and the people can deduct their taxes. And in my PhD, I, it's a long story, but I basically made the, the, I think the case that you have as much as public money through this indirect system in the US to fund the arts that you have in France with a direct system. I don't want to say one is good and the other is bad. Actually, they are both good and bad. They have all good effects and counter effects and the catch-22 and so on and so forth. But you do have a cultural policy in the US. In addition of that, you have big agencies. And for culture, cultural industry, but also for the internet, you have a large number of uh, organizations that play a key role uh, to develop this sector. To focus more on the internet, I will say that everybody knows, and in general it's like uh, something like CIA uh, behind uh, uh, controlling uh, whatever you think. Of course, we know that the Ministry of Defense and the CIA played a role on the beginning of the internet story. But it's not that in particular that is so important. Stanford University, which is uh, actually a very beautiful campus, a little bit like this one, is extremely uh, rich. But this is not a for-profit university. It is a non-profit university. It's not public, but this, this is not private in the sense of commercial. It's in between the non-profit sector. And this is my second point. The non-profit sector, it's the key player of the game to fund, in general, all the activities that cannot be made by the market, because the market uh, doesn't really uh, uh, know how to do experimentation, taking risks, uh, uh, teaching, and these kind of things. But it's not made by the government, uh, uh, because in the US, they don't want that the government be involved in these kind of things. So typically, Stanford University, and I dedicate one chapter of my book uh, in Stanf on Stanford, um, 
is a place where is a non-profit sector where uh, you get a lot of public money through uh, the research, uh, through the uh, everything that the student can can do as an internship, the the scholarships, and many other things. So you have a key player in the game, which is a university, non-profit one, in the middle of the Silicon Valley. And as, as you know, there is uh, tons of other universities everywhere in the country. Third element, uh, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of um, woman, freedom of whatever you, you think. It's not a, 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 an accident that the internet was basically, I mean, grow from a place where it was uh, also the place of the hippies movement, of the beat generation, of the Castro, which is one of the best, I mean, most important gay community in the world. And also uh, a place where counterculture is everywhere extremely uh, influential. If I make this point, it's not, I mean, you know that and it's not a surprise for you. But think about China, where basically all these things don't exist. Think about Saudi Arabia, where basically women's rights, and not even speaking about gay rights, don't even exist. Think about uh, um, a woman that want to be part of that. Think so it's, it is a very important factor of the development of the, this uh, system. A fourth point, it's of course diversity. Uh, we all, in general, believe in diversity uh, because everybody is for diversity. I don't know anyone that will say I'm against diversity. But there is two ways to think diversity. The first way is, I would say, the, the public kind of uh, UNESCO way to say diversity, it's a way to protect our culture. And the French are very good on that. We believe in this uh, strategy. And it's a way also the Canada thinks about uh, uh, culture. Uh, for example, uh, to protect uh, the French language in Quebec or, uh, uh, or some heritage and, and so on. And then there is the second way of thinking about diversity, which means basically to have a large number of uh, Korean and, uh, and uh, Colombian and then Mexican and then Brazilian and then whatever uh, origin uh, it can be in your territory. And this is more the American US approach of diversity. And I am very surprised all the time by the fact that the European, the Canada, some others, the China also actually, are fighting a lot for cultural diversity, thinking on the first element, first definition, but without giving any rights to minorities. For example, the French like uh, very much diversity, but when it's about giving money to the Arabs to create a theater, we don't give them any money because we don't want them to stay Arab. We want them to become French. And then you have the opposite, which is the US, which basically fight against cultural diversity everywhere in the world, especially here. In mainstream, I, 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 I said how the MPAA, for example, the lobby of the movie industry, it's, it's true also with the music industry, are basically spend the last 50 years to destroy the movie industry in Mexico, and also the music a little bit. They don't, just don't want a, mu a, a real movie industry to exist in this country. So they have done that also to destroy quotas about uh, uh, movies in uh, South Korea, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, on their own territory, they really believe on diversity, thanks to the 40 plus million of Mexicans that live in, uh, in the US, uh, 38 uh, million of blacks, 14 million of uh, Asi Asian, uh, and so on and so forth. So this kind of cross uh, attitude, those who defend diversity at home like the US, but destroy it abroad, and the other one that wants uh, large di diversity abroad, but don't accept it at home, makes me thinking a lot all the time. And uh, I don't know where is exactly Mexico in this debate, but hypocrisy, hypocritical attitude in this uh, uh, subject is quite often, uh, very often the, the case. There is many other uh, elements that 
probably explain why the US is uh, very powerful in creativity, innovation, uh, and the internet. Of course, I can go on uh, all the economic as aspects, uh, like typically, um, I would say the question of um, um, venture capitalist, the way you help startup, the way you, uh, you are able to very quickly go from a scale to another one, what we call scalability, scalability, which helps you to, uh, to, ad to, to adapt very quickly to the market and then to become a player in the world. See, for example, like how Netflix this year is going basically from a two, three country to like 20 countries in a single year. Uh, that needs, of course, a lot of money and a capability to, to go very quickly on that. I, I might be very long on, on this subject of uh, economic f funding, but I'm, first of all, I think you, you're a little bit aware about that uh, already, and I dedicate one chapter on that, and also it's something that you know probably more than the other things, so I want to go quick, quicker on that. I will add uh, a last point, uh, which is also very important uh, to, to explain the role of the US on the internet, uh, and actually creative industry in general, influence. You have also, in the US, a very strong, uh, I would say, govern, governmental government, uh, uh, group of uh, federal agency and, and, uh, and different other public bodies that plays a role in the game. Again, we think, when we don't know very well the US, that it's like uh, the, a free country for a free man. Basically, you do whatever you want. It's absolutely not true. It's an extremely well-regulated system. And for the internet, for example, the regulation is extremely complex. I've found more than 20 agencies that play a role in the regulation of the internet. You have, first of all, the famous agency created by Roosevelt, the FCC and the FTC. FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, the FTC, the Trade Commission. They, they are all agency from the New Deal, and they are not free market, open market, total agency. They want to regulate. Of course, they are not against the market. They are for the market. But they want a market that is open to everybody with a kind of just, uh, with a kind of uh, neutral attitude to be able to succeed. And so they are doing many, many cases, uh, actually hundreds of cases, against Amazon, against Google, against Apple, on whatever is uh, uh, what we call a dominant uh, position uh, abuse. Uh, and they are fighting uh, against this corporation all year long. Sometimes against one, so in favor of another one, sometimes against several one, sometimes uh, uh, playing a difficult game because it is extremely complex. In addition of that, you have the public, uh, because this agency, FTC and FCC, are independent. In addition, you have agencies that, that are really the government, like the Ministry of Commerce or uh, the Ministry of Justice. Uh, I don't go... I don't want to go too much in the details again, but you will see how it's important to, to, to see how, how all these kind of things work. The Department of Justice has a very important uh, bureau, the Antitrust Bureau. Actually, it's a division, the Antitrust Division. That is the, the government trying to regulate, not spe specifically internet, of course. It's a regulation of all the market economy on many aspects. And basically, the, the, they do that in the name of the people. The Department of Commerce has a, another agency within it, the NTIA, it's a little bit uh, technical. And this agency owns, for now, still, the so-called ICANN. And ICANN is the agency that gives for everybody around the world the domain names. So basically, when you create, I don't know, uh, uh, 
let's say my website, frederickmartel.com, this is the, the, this agency that gives the capability of accepting or not the creation of any website. Of course, they do that through many intermediaries uh, agency, especially one in every country. But ICANN is the big one that uh, uh, summarizes all the uh, requests. And the link is totally direct to the NTIA, which is the Department of Commerce, which is the federal government of the US. Right now, an important debate on internationally is how to break, to, to stop the link between ICANN and uh, the NTIA, so the Department of Commerce. But for now, it's still the case, and we'll see how it's going to, to change. And by the way, ICANN is a, is a, is a non-profit organization regulated by a public, even though a bit secret, uh, contract with the Department of Commerce. But it has to stay, and they cannot change their, 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 um, their juridical uh, status, a US non-profit 501c3, we call it that way, uh, non-profit organization based in California. So for now, they have to stay in California as a, as a 501c3. So 501c3 is basically the non-profit organization in the, in the US. So you see how, and I can add also the Supreme Court. We can add many other agencies that play a role uh, uh, in many, many aspects on regulation of the internet. Let's say, for example, the question of privacy, which is a very important one especially today, after the Snowden and uh, all the debate on the NSA, uh, you know, piracy and actually uh, uh, stall of information. It's very, it's very um, clear that you have in the US the first amendment of the Constitution that allows liberty of freedom, freedom of expression. And so basically, it is a, a way to make the internet free, which means nobody can control it. And this amendment of the Constitution has been used for a long time to actually to, to accept every kind of content on the internet. Even the debate on pornography in the beginning of the internet, pornography was allowed in the, on the internet because of the first amendment of the, the US Constitution. By the way, brackets, we are in Mexico. I'm in France, people are in China, they are in Latin America, whatever. They obey to the rules that have been decided 15 years ago, 20 years ago, by the Supreme Court of the US. Brackets closed. Uh, so at the same time, there is the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution, which is about privacy. And actually, it is an amendment of the Constitution to protect privacy. So you can see how between the first and the fourth, the debate is pretty open and is going to be a long battle. This is why, even though I can make some jokes sometimes uh, against the US, I do think that we are not going to regulate the internet because the internet cannot be regulated. But we can and we should regulate the actors of the internet, basically Google, Facebook, Twitter, and all the others. And we will do that, this is my I would say hypothesis, not against the US, but with the US. Because this kind of agency, like the FCC, the FTC, the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice, the Supreme Court, have actually shown in the past that they do believe in privacy, because it's also the US Constitution. They do believe of, on, on market, uh, the, the market economy, but a right one, a real one, that doesn't accept the uh, dominant position, the abuse of dominant position, and so on and so forth. So maybe we have to make some pressure to this agency to work. And this is probably what uh, is doing the European Union right now. And this is good that the EU, European Union works with the US on this kind of regulation. But I do think we will have some allies within the US on the, the subject we really care about, like privacy, uh, data relocation, and so on, and so forth. I want to try just to ask you maybe to make some comments, questions, and before going to, to China. Oui? 
Take the microphone if you can. Um, yes, uh, this has more to do with what you said before at uh, the beginning. Um, we're talking here about the internet as a, as a tool of access to information, right? And you're talking here in the example of the US about privacy and how internet cannot actually be regulated. Um, my question would be, if we consider the internet as a tool for diplomacy, um, would it jeopardize or rather benefit countries in terms of uh, what you've just said, like the example of pornography? Uh, this has to do with uh, US regulations, but we are seeing it all around the world. So for diplomacy and to use it uh, in favor or in benefit of a country specifically, how would this be regulated or how would you, I mean, what's your perspective on how to manage those kind of things? You know, <clears throat> first of all, if I will, uh, will have the solution, uh, you know, uh, I don't, <coughs> I don't believe in a regulation that can be made by uh, what we call IUT, UIET, depending on the language you use, which is the United Nations Agency for Telecommunication, basically, which, which is based in Geneva. And many countries, basically China, the Arab country, even, I guess, um, Iran, of course, wanted the IUT to take, to, to get in charge of the ICANN and all these kind of things. I don't believe in that. Because if you do that, first of all, it's going to be the United Nations, which means a lot of meetings and nothing uh, works. Or like the FIFA, which is sometimes worse. <coughs> and I think it cannot be decided by the government altogether. At the same time, I really believe ICANN has to stop to be a US agency. So for example, I made a proposition in the book that it should be Switzerland, or like a European or whatever agency, They're just to make sure that it has no link with uh, the US. And second of all, it's uh, important that the link with the, <coughs> sorry, the NTIA was, I mean, will be, uh, will be uh, stopped. At the same time, I do believe that we, we do need more regulation on the national base. So it's a little bit difficult to say that because, of course, you have China and you have Iran uh, immediately in your mind. But I think uh, it has to be extremely careful, but we need some global regulation, especially on the technical aspects, spectrum, and all these kind of things. And then, you know, anti-Semitic law, for example, are not the same in the US and in Europe. I mean, you like it or not, but I mean, people have the right to decide what is good or not for, for their country. So at the end, it's not normal that Twitter decide because of some regulation in the US uh, that some Hitler, uh, I don't know, God, goods will be uh, sell in Germany, even if it's forbidden in Germany. So uh, at the end, I think we will need to have more, especially for the big four, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, what we call the GAFA, we will probably need to have a little bit more regulation on, on the local base. And they have to follow the, the laws uh, where, wherever they are. In addition, I do believe we can do some data relocations, uh, maybe not for specific countries. In Brazil, they tried to do that, but uh, it didn't work, and it won't work. Uh, for many reasons. I can go back on that later if you want. Uh, but I believe that some data relocation at least are possible, for example, for the European Union as large, you know, because Amazon, has, of course, and Facebook, they have the, the, the computer and the memory and the servers to be able to, to keep the data there. And, uh, but th it's going to be a, one of the big debates of the next uh, years. Well, uh, you were uh, talking about the NSA affairs and how, for example, they have uh, and, uh, strong influence, for example, in terms of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, and nonetheless, I, I would like to ask you what you think about uh, particularly the Whistleblower Act 
that uh, exist in the United States and that, uh, for example, in the case of Edward Snowden or in the case of um, Bradley Manning or I might say Chelsea Manning, whatever. It's uh, Chelsea now. It's, Ch it's Chelsea now. Uh, or even uh, Julian Assange, etc. Um, the, the Whistleblower Act actually is a very good law because uh, it provides uh, uh, judicial uh, support to those people that actually is inside a, a public organization uh, or uh, a public institution uh, to report, um, let's say, uh, uh, some sort of uh, wrong behavior in that particular institution. But uh, in those particular cases, we have seen that the Whistleblower Act had been practically erased. Uh, I mean, it's, they are part of the debates. They are very important indeed, but um, uh, the, uh, it, it is not taken into account particularly for, for, for these uh, three cases. I know, what, what do you think about it? <clears throat> I mean, First of all, I was the, the French uh, journalist that uh, launched a, a petition that ended up being uh, extremely, uh, I mean, the cover of some news magazine and a lot of people uh, being uh, uh, asking the French government to give the political asylum of Edward Snowden. So my position is pretty clear on, on, on that subject. At the same time, uh, I know some have uh, classes now, so this is why I... But we'll, I see you tomorrow, don't forget. <laughs> I have the name. And the... Uh, so basically, at the same time, this idea of a world that will be open, uh, that everybody can put any telegram diplomatic secrecy on the internet, thanks to the, the technical possibility, is not, not a world that you can accept either. So we still have to be very balanced in these kind of things. I mean, I'm globally in favor of, the, of them, but at the same time, I mean, a country needs also, uh, you know, we have Edward Snowden, but we would have loved to have an Edward Snowden in Iran, an Edward Snowden in China, an Edward Snowden in Cuba, an Edward Snowden in North Korea. Because basically, I mean, I might be uh, too American saying that, but I trust more the U.S. in many aspects than I trust the other four one that I just mentioned. Another reaction here? Yes. I try to avoid it. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, so let, let's finish with, the, with some information and the discussion about uh, China. Uh, I, I went uh, to China three, three times for this research in probably 10 cities. And by the way, uh, maybe if some of you uh, do some research or want to be journalists, we can discuss after the class or tomorrow or the day after how you work on this kind of research for how you get the money, how you're able to, to, to organize uh, your research. But something about China, it's when you arrive in China, it's not I mean, when you arrive in Mexico, <laughs> you have uh, two or three contacts, and after a week, you have seen everybody. You call the guys, and they say, oh, yes, come, and uh, I have a friend, he will receive you. I mean, they're very friendly, they're open, uh, they know you're from abroad. When you have just uh, two days more, they, they will make all possible to, uh, to, to, to find the time to, to accept, uh, to have a coffee with you. Actually, the same in India. In India, when I arrived in India the first time, I had one meeting for like two weeks. I was like des desperate because nobody answered my email, nobody called. And so I see them and then I call the other guys and immediately they say, oh yeah, so I remember I didn't answer because I never answered this kind of email, but come to the party tonight and you will see all the people of the movie industry of Bollywood and then you saw like 200 people in two weeks. So this is the kind of way you work in the Arab world sometimes in Latin America, in India. In China, everything has to be set up like three weeks before. You don't enter any website or uh, uh, not even speaking about a government building without like, uh, 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 giving the list of the question you're going to ask. Uh, of course, after that, you do whatever you want, uh, who you are, uh, a message from the embassy, and so on and so forth. So it's extremely complicated and difficult to, to work, but you ended up working there. And uh, what I discovered about the internet, 
that you already might know. It's, uh, it's not internet, it's another internet. It's not really an intranet in the sense that the goal of China is not to create, the goal is not to create something just for, for China and for Chinese people. What they want to do, because it's a very nationalistic and economical actually goal, they want to create an internet for the Chinese people to control them, but also to go abroad with this internet. And when I say the, when I see the, the spoke uh, person of uh, Beidou, Baidu, we say in Chinese, I think, Baidu, it's the equivalent of Google in China. I said to him, oh, you want to go abroad? You, you're going to go to, I, I, I know, Iran, uh, Cuba, Venezuela. And he looked at me and he said, no, we're going to go to India, Brazil, Mexico, and so on and so forth. So his goal was basically emerging countries. And so you discover us, I discovered step by step that all the websites that have been created in the US have, what a surprise, a copycat in China. You don't have Amazon, you have Alibaba. You don't have Google, you have Baidu. You don't have Ren Ren, you don't have Facebook, sorry, you have Ren Ren. We say Jen Jen in Chinese. You don't have uh, YouTube, you have Yuku, you don't have uh, Twitter, you have uh, the Weibo's and so on and so forth. They recreate clones exactly the same or more or less or changing. Of course, they spend hours to explain me how the, their websites are totally different than the US one. And sometimes they even told me that Twitter is copying what they do on Weibo and that they are bad guys, that they make a copy of the Weibo, which is more efficient. And Baidu is more intelligent than, than Google. And this is why Google tried to replicate them and so on and so forth. But at the end, they created this system, which is totally a copycat of the web, but for basically the Chinese. And at the end, the Chinese don't go at all on Google. Now it's totally forbidden. They don't go to Facebook, which is also forbidden. Uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia it depends a lot. Uh, for example, if you go on um, Wikipedia and you, and you see, uh, you, you, you mention Tiananmen, you have a history uh, of a very nice place in the history, uh, flowers and mountains and all these kind of things. So basically, the, the, the way uh, it's organized, it is, a, 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 I would say, a, an internet because they use the same protocol that internet, but every point of entry is uh, controlled and they have created for their own a very large number of websites that are actually extremely popular. We have basically now, the, the numbers are not very accurate in China. So sometimes they add one billion by, by month, by day, we don't know. But probably more than three, four, five hundred million people connected every day on the internet in China. Alibaba, if you take a number that is kind of probably possible to trust, uh, the, num the volume d'affaires, as you say, that uh, the, the number of uh, go goods, uh, business that is done on Alibaba, it's the same than Amazon, PayPal, and eBay all together. So the power of this, uh, and the number two of search engine in the world, it's Beidou already. And probably on video, it's Yuku. So it is not a small uh, story, it is a big one. And uh, at the same time, it's of course extremely censored and controlled. Sorry? It's a private sector, yes, yes. But private sector in, in China means the government is behind the somewhere. It's like, uh, uh, basically, nothing can be done by foreign uh, corporation, and nothing can be done without. Yes, I mean, it's totally controlled. Even the, the censorship are within the website. So for example, I don't know for all of them, because it's, uh, you can imagine it's a little bit complex to interview all these people. I've done meeting with all of them several times, but it takes a long time. And for example, the, 
the one I really uh, tried to, to the Weibo. There is four Weibo actually in, in China. So there are four, four kinds of Twitter, not just one, but whatever. And they are all two different, but the so, so U one is the most uh, important one. And the, the sensors are inside the office. So basically, the people work for, uh, to control that. And how they control that? It is the problem. First of all, when, when internet was just blog, it's pretty easy to control a blog. When you see somebody that, that writes uh, things that you don't like, you close the blog and that's finished. You can recreate one, but it's very easy to find at least the address and to stop it. With the Weibo or GenGen, basically Twitter and Facebook, it's a million, actually hundreds of millions that exchange every day hundreds of millions of messages. How could you control that? Even though they said there is 5,000, 50,000, nobody knows, kind of police guys of the web in China, you cannot work. I mean, it cannot work. So what they do, what, what, what they use, it's like automatical uh, um, words, uh, keywords. Um, for example, uh, if you write uh, June 4th in Chinese, which is the day of Tiananmen, the message disappears immediately. So then the Chinese kids have invited, uh, have uh, created another way to say June 4th, which is uh, May 35. So they add uh, one day to the May, uh, they, they add like to say. But then of course the police got that. So then they, they, they said uh, April 65, and then uh, March 96, and so on and so forth. At the end, nobody was uh, b being able to understand what they were doing. They have also many ways to, uh, they are very smart now uh, in comparison of before. Before they were s destroying uh, uh, the, the blog and quite often arresting the blogger. Now they basically uh, make things like you publish your tweet, you see it, but you are the only one. So all your followers don't see it. Or you publish your tweet, and after three days the tweet appears, but not before the time they were able to, to control it, and so on and so forth. So there is many tools they, they use, but <coughs> I do think that it's getting more and more complicated for the censorship to be able to, to, to work on that. At the same time, if I want to be a little bit more uh, neutral, I would say that uh, as, as a French, probably you as Mexican, we are extremely um, aware and uh, interested by censorship. And we don't accept that by definition. But I don't think you can explain the internet in China uh, just by that. To, to tell that, to put it in another way, if you, I mean, it's about 1 billion 400 million people. Millions of tweets, messages every day. Censorship cannot explain by itself how a system like that can work. And this is how I go back to my hypothesis, general hypothesis. For me, internet is fragmented, but before even some censorship by, by Chinese or others. I mean, for a large number of Chinese, they don't need to get outside. Of course, I don't want to say they don't want. Of course they want, probably. But they don't need, in, as a matter of fact. Because first of all, a large number of them don't speak English or Spanish, so what are you going to read uh, outside? Second of all, they use internet with their friends, as I said before. Their friends are in China, and they are even in their village or in their town, their big city. They are on their ren ren. Uh, it works pretty well. It's cheap. Uh, they are able to communicate with their friends and f make funny, crazy photographs and whatever they want. And at the end, they don't really need to go out. Of course, when you speak to a dissident, and I met many of them in uh, Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, or in the US, they, they are against uh, censorship by definition, and we, we, we are too. But one of the reasons why this incredible system, which ca when you think about how billions of, of, of dollars they have probably put to create this kind of other internet just to avoid 
just for, for a general censorship of the content. It's crazy, but it works because of the nature of the internet that re really is like Alibaba, the website, which is a kind of Amazon and eBay, as I said before. Uh, I mean, they do, they, they communicate between people to buy, to buy goods. They don't buy the, boot, the goods in India, which is too far away, or not even in the US. So things are organized for the Chinese market. And of course, uh, some people want to go out. Some people try. And, and actually, it works because the, the dissident, like many people, not many, but the people that know a little bit internet know how to uh, overpass the, the censorship. You have filter breakers. You have, uh, uh, it's not easy, but I've done that myself. So it's possible you create, uh, uh, you, it's, you, with your filter breaker, for example, you, you, you re-base yourself staying in China. You, you, you said you, you are in Canada, and then everything is open. So you're like in Canada, even though you stay in China, and then you can access every uh, website. So it's a way of, uh, of working. I do think um, in Cuba, for example, they are more or less working on the direction of the, of the Chinese model. And they're already with their system of uh, emails that are just for Cubans doing that. Russia is working in the same direction. Uh, Iran is uh, uh, very much trying to, to create a system close to China. And uh, uh, in a different way, some others are uh, working also on, on, on that. And this is why Beidou and the other big uh, Chinese websites are extremely interesting to, to follow because it's going to be an important part of the debate in the, in the coming years. Just a, a, a joke for, to finish before some exchanges. Uh, when I was in Iran uh, <coughs> working on the internet, it's very f funny because you are like in, in the main streets uh, in Tehran, and uh, you have uh, a lot of cyber cafe there. It's very easy to get on the internet. And when you, when you enter the place, they ask you, do you want a, a, an internet with censorship or without censorship? So they, even like in the, in the street. I mean, like it's, and then you can go, and because when you're French, you want, the, you want to go to Google and all these kind of things. So you go to the other one. And then I tried a little bit to go to the censor one. And I, I, for example, I put the word sex, and they said to me, I can buy the Quran <laughs> immediately. And then we, we tried, because somebody told me the story, I put Dick Cheney, and it was censored immediately. But not because they don't like the US, because the word Dick in Dick Cheney, you know, it was kind of funny. What kind of uh, question exchange can we have now? We have uh, 15 minutes. Can, yes? So could you say that the underground trend that is going right now in between governments is like anti-globalization? You know, like uh, Sorry? they're trying to apart themselves from the U.S. creating their own internet, as you were saying with Russia, uh, Cuba, Iran. Uh, how you know, can this, this affect the, the markets? The it, it depends. On, I mean, basically, China has the system that I just mentioned. Iran, we, we don't know exactly. They said they are going to create their own internet. But for now, it's an internet the same than everywhere, but it's censored by keywords, basically. Pretty well, but still, uh, uh, there is a censorship very, very, very strong, especially on, on YouTube, which is always a place where videos are, are quite often censored by, by governments. <coughs> but to create your own, it, it, I mean, it, you need really like a lot of money. For example, Cuba is not, it's probably not able to do that today, except if the Chinese do that for them, which is totally possible. But would you say that is a trend that is going on? Going on? Uh, uh, no. Yes, then I got your question about anti-globalization. You know, the things here in this point, in this subject, we are not about, it's not the question of globalization. Like we, with Iran, China, 
uh, Cuba, we are on the question of you know, dictatorship. It's something else. It's, so I don't think it's a trend you can see outside of the, like in Brazil, here, in France, <coughs> quite often we want to, for example, to some, some content has to be censored because we have law already that censor them. So this is not exactly the same debate. Uh, the fact that uh, we are going to go on an internet that will be more fragmented and where some kind of law will apply to some of the big GAFA on the national base, it's probably a trend, I assume. This is my hypothesis. The, the Chinese way, I don't think it's a, it's a trend. It's basically a dictatorship that wants to keep the power and uh, knows that uh, the, the system of the unique party won't survive if there is freedom of expression. That's as simple as that. It's exactly the same story for, for Cuba. Oui? Uh, does this uh, Chinese system, it is a threat for the world, for the internet in, in the world? What do you mean a trend? A threat. Oh, a threat? A threat, yes. Um, I mean, we, serve, we, we live with that, uh, we have lived already with that for, I mean, 10 years, so we, we survived. <laughs> so is it a threat? The threat will be that every country will create that then you don't have what internet was supposed to be as a, a, not the global conversation, but at least the possibility of a global conversation. Uh, but uh, this is why actually the US, uh, have a, uh, uh, they have a, a strong responsibility on, on what's happening now. Because the Snowden story and the NSA you know, basically destroy this idea of internet being a place neutral. Uh, so this is why I think they made a very big mistake. Uh, first of all, to do what they have done. Second of all, at least to have Snowden that was able to get the information and to get out with that. So what I want to say on that point is that at the end, uh, I guess it may be a good news because Thanks to Snowden, we know something like that can happen. The 1984 kind of world of control. So basically now, everywhere in the world, from Brazil to France, Germany, the Chancellor, Japan, not even speaking of Iran, China, and these kind of countries, everybody wants more data relocation, privacy, control of data, and all this kind of thing. So at the end, it's a good news. And I think we had an internet before Snowden and another internet after. No, well, I have a question. <laughs> Are you um, allowed? <laughs> I don't know. Am I allowed? You give yes. you your own uh, <laughs> possibility. <laughs> well, um, speaking about this a Chinese system, I don't know, I'm thinking about the geopolitical code of uh, Chinese, which is like based on this Pacific development in the sense that they want to... I mean, in a sense, they want to uh, create this sort of empathy or like uh, likability to their culture to make it attractive. Uh, would it be the internet would be a tool to do actually that to achieve that? I mean, because we've we've heard this expression um, or I don't know about that China does not need the world, but the world needs China. So, if we relate it. In that uh, part, would it be a way to make it more attractive? Because you said they wanted to go aboard, right? You know, we were very surprised, uh, very surprised, uh, I think, two years ago, to, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by the fact that the, the Supreme Communist Party uh, communication of the year, the, the president of China said that the priority was soft power. And so soft power, as you know, the, the expression comes from uh, uh, Joseph Nye in the US. Actually, it's the name of my radio show in, uh, in France, on uh, French NPR. And I use also a lot the expression in the beginning of mainstream. And uh, so I like the expression soft power. Soft power means you influence people not by, uh, you, you have power not just by the military and, and coercion, traditional diplomacy, and, low, uh, and strong economy, 
but you influence also people through uh, culture, values, internet, all this kind of, and this is what we call soft power. So they said soft power is their priority, and they want, and they said to me that all the time. They want to, to have a, a blockbuster, a worldwide blockbuster. They want that the Chinese music will be heard everywhere. They want to send cultural attaché and Confucius open uh, Confucius Center everywhere in the world. And on the internet, as they told me, and they're very, I mean, without difficulties, yes, we want to go abroad. We want to, to, to become a giant in front of the Americans, to be part of the market, and be, uh, and be in the world with our uh, website and culture and so on and so forth. So it's true that, first of all, it's their priority. I mean, one of their priority. Second of all, they have the money to do that. They have the political system to do it, the industry to do it. They, uh, they have the will. But will they succeed? Then the question is back on what I said before. Why the American system is, is so strong and how it's able to work? It works because of cultural diversity. It works because of freedom of expression. It works, of, I mean, because of the, the woman uh, freedom, because of the, basically the dissent, this culture of, uh, of the hippies. You know, you cannot imagine in Beidou, hippies. <laughs> Even though they try a little bit, and I saw some have with long hair, and I've, they write also, you know, the same slogan that you have in the Silicon Valley, uh, stupid things on the wall. They, they try to make it a little bit like that. But the thing is, at the end, the, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party that control directly all that, won't allow, I mean, this kind of freedom. So, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not against China. But for now, the only blockbuster in the movie industry we have seen very successful about China is Kung Fu Panda. And it has been made by the Americans. So I haven't seen any. I mean, uh, you can, if you like uh, RT or like specific movies, probably you have seen some. But basically, the movie industry doesn't, is not able to produce uh, 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 like a blockbuster. Why? Because the story they, they tell are totally controlled. Why? Because the people uh, cannot uh, speak about, I mean, the, the policeman in a, in a movie has to be a good guy. And the, the gangster is a bad guy. And of course, that's not a very good story. The good story, when the good uh, became bad and, and, and so on and so forth. No sex, no, you cannot say anything about Japanese, you cannot speak about the party, about drugs, about the reality of the regime, about social issue, and so on and so forth. So you see, for the movie industry, what are the problems? It's the same for, for video games. It's the same, in a way, for music. And at, on the subject of the internet, it's also a little bit the same. They are able to create tools. Probably they will. They already have some. Even though South Korea and Japan, sometimes India, are better. But on the content side, for now, I haven't seen anything. But it might change. We'll see. Yes? Well, so we have 10 more minutes. <coughs> well, perfect. Uh, well, actually, um, I don't know if uh, it's possible to have some certain hopes in the World Soviet and Information Society and the kind of agreements, even though uh, the, the issue is that uh, they're not agreements. Uh, for example, the, uh, one of the, of the discussions is, it was about the ICANN role in, uh, for example, stealing and ruling on the internet because there were this kind of, um, uh, let's say, deja vus from the New world, in for, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that in terms of the new order in communication and so on. Uh, and it's still the ideological struggle between those who think that uh, exists um, uh, a political agenda in the control of internet and those who want another kind of possibilities by means of internet. Because at the end, internet is it's supposed to be a place for uh, exchange of ideas, 
thoughts, uh, points of view, etc. Uh, what do you think about this? I mean, and the, the, the results uh, of these particular meetings, uh, well, the last one, uh, uh, just having some pre pre uh, preparation uh, meetings in the last uh, few years, but what do you think about the possibility of, of these particular meetings in, in, uh, in, 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 con um, in particular way about the World Summit in Information Society? I mean, f what you are saying, it's the debate that we are going to have in the next couple of years. And the fight is extremely strong. By the way, uh, the, for example, the European Union, which is a player important in the game as well, was very against the US in the beginning about ICANN and so on. And we are still. But when it was the question of uh, who is going to regulate internet, we immediately back, were back with the US against, of course, China and Iran. And we basically protected the ICANN system because we didn't want to have a problem with China that will censor all the things. So at the end, the debate is extremely uh, strong. I think the, the US made a lot of mistakes. They should have break, broken the link with ICANN for a long time. Uh, because the problem, if, if they don't do these kind of things in, enough soon, then one day it will be too late, and then it will be something else. So uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm very optimistic in general. I'm an optimistic guy, but I do think that. Uh, so I think internet will survive, and don't, I don't see a very big dan danger uh, in the next uh, decades. But uh, but it, it is extremely important to correct all these things very very quickly, and to be able to. Uh, uh, to create new ways of the multitasker uh, way of doing things so with the government, civil society, uh, tech company, all together in several committees. There is many ways to, to find some solutions. And, and at the end, uh, it's also true that, uh, and I will go back on that uh, when I will speak on regulations, but uh, it's true that uh, uh, the US has also, they, they need to regulate their own uh, giants of the, of the internet, otherwise, uh, again, it's going to be uh, more uh, uh, difficult to, to, to stop the, the will of many countries to, to create their own internet and, and so on. So tomorrow, uh, <clears throat> I will go more on social and economic issues with smart cities, many examples in several other countries, and uh, also uh, uh, how you try to revit revitalize, uh, recreate uh, uh, e economy in a very uh, uh, empowering area uh, in, through the internet. And the day after, I will go more on content, um, medias, and also curation, smart curation, as I call it. Uh, I'll say a little bit more <coughs> if you need to exchange. And uh, tomorrow, uh, afternoon, I will be also here for one or two hours to speak with some of you if you, if you need. Thanks a lot for today.